Wickham and I am a prolific novelist. Um, but this series is about how I keep from going crazy, keep from becoming a famous author, like in the my very first video. So I kind of talk about the things that I do besides writing that I enjoy. So this one is about antiquing. And I kind of have a different way of antiquing. What I like to do, I always search for things that have a story or a potential story. I love old photographs and feelings like that it's connected to the past. I also like to get uh, things that I feel like that it's been lost, like it was once precious to someone and had slipped out of the family's fingers and it needs someone to take care of it to safeguard it because its original guardians have gone. So I've got a few of those things here and I tell you what I, what I do with them when I can, when I find you so, the very first thing that I'm going to show you is a collar box. How many of you know this, but um, kind of in, well, no, not Victorian times, but uh, Edwardian times, yeah, some Victorian for men, um, people had removable collars. So if you remember the, <laughs> the beginning of the animated version of Peter Pan, Remember how the dad is trying all the time to get his collar and it always keeps flying and just driving him crazy and so his wife has to fasten that for him and then tie his tie? That's, that's what that is. And it's because washing things was so caustic um, that it could damage the shirt. So, But this is the part that would get dirty on you, uh, on a man, and then in Edwardian times when they had higher collars on a woman especially if she had powder or whatever. So they could take the collar off the shirt, wash that, starch it, and put it back on. So I found this collar box in the antique store. It was $40, which kind of made me go, because I'm not a rich woman. But I just kept coming back to it and thinking about it, and I thought, oh, I just, I just have to get this, because it's, it's such a neat personal item that these people kept and and it has collars in it still. I think that's what I was so excited about was it's not just a neat box. It has the collars. So I thought, well, this would look lovely in my room, but I Okay, so the first one of the first series of books that I ever read was Nancy Drew. So I'm always into looking for clues and solving mysteries. That's just, that's just been me always. So these collars, here's one here. And if you can see that one, that's a small collar. That is not a man collar. And on the inside of this collar, it says Pearl Plank. How would you like that for a name? I don't know if you can see it. Pearl Plank. So that that is apparently her name. Size 13. And then here's this one is definitely a man collar. It's big and tall. It's a little smaller, but that's a man's collar. And you see the button there. And inside here it says Sanford. Lindered buttonholes, um, just the the company name, but also it says A. Burfield. Can you see that? A. Burfield, right there. That's a stamp. That's not. That is not a a brand name. That's like something extra that got put in there. 
and I think, yeah, all of his are stamped A. Burfield on the inside of these collars. He has quite a few. He has... Oh, wait, never mind. He didn't stamp A. Burfield in, in this one. But he has four collars. Oh, this one. Oh, this is a hefty... Ooh, look at this. What? So he has four collars, and then Pearl Plank had one. And they were all kept in here. And then in the top, when you open up this little plink thing, here's a couple of the little fasteners for the collar. So because um, I could tell where the collars came from and also uh, some names inside here, I wanted to find out who they were. So I did, and it actually didn't take me very long. Um, So, I found them, which is very exciting. So, Arthur Leonard Burfield, that's his name. And he was born the 22nd of February, 1885, in Rice County, Kansas. And he died on the 19th of May, 1967, aged 82, in, yeah, in Kansas. And he's buried in the Lyons Municipal Cemetery in Rice County. And then his wife, Pearl May Plank Burfield. She was born in 1887 and she died in 1970. And his parents were John James Burfield and Margaret Shea Burfield. And they had children. Uh, Pearl and Arthur had children. Cletus Leonard Burfield and he died in 1985. And then Marvel Verl Burfield. And I think that's probably a boy, but it could be a girl, I don't know. Uh, died in 1992. And I could find out more about them if I wanted to, but that's probably why um, the collar box is in an antique store. Because everybody died. And they sold it off at an estate sale. So there they are. Isn't that interesting? So I have Arthur and Pearl Burfield's collars. They wore to work. They wore out to the theater, to dinner. I don't know, I just like it. I just like that thought. It didn't get thrown away. I've got it. It's safe. It's safe. I protected it for you. All right, so the next thing I have is this very cool book that I found in a uh, antique store in Leavenworth. And it is the little leather bound book um, by Edward Everett Hale. And the book is called The Man Without a Country. So, The Man Without a Country was written um, kind of during the Civil War, and it was just it's about patriotism and um, how if you hate your own country, you become rootless and uh, disconnected from everything. Um, but I did find a name on the inside of this, Neville Dragoo. Now, if that's not an unusual name, I don't know what is. So, I was able to find Mr. Neville Dragoo. So, Neville Franklin Dragoo. He was born the 17th of June, 1872, in Brown County, Ohio, USA. So this traveled, because this is, I bought this in Leavenworth. Um, he died the 23rd of June, 1961, aged 89 in Fairfax, Atchison County, Missouri. Oh, that's why. <laughs> he brought it with him. <laughs> um, he was buried in Pleasant Ridge Cemetery, Fairfax, Atchison County, Missouri. Uh, let's see, and his parents were James Milton Dragoo, uh, and his mother was Mary Jane Redmond Dragoo, and he was married three times. 
Uh, Eustacia Jane Downing Dragoo was the first one. That can't be right. Oh, wait, no. Okay. And then he married a lady, Evelyn Estella Gaudet Dragoo, who was exactly the same age as his first wife. And then the next wife was also exactly the same age. Sadie Jane Blair Dragoo. Ooh. Hmm. And they all died. It was not a divorce. It was de death, death, death. And he had siblings. Dexter Lovell and Clara Bell. <laughs> so, but I like his taste in books. This is a good book. And the next thing I have is a book that I bought here in town at an antique store called Among Melee Pirates, A Tale of Adventure and Peril by G.A. Henty. And inside this book is a name, Harry M. Kelly, Vermilion, Kansas. And he wrote a date in here, one 206, which I'm assuming is 1906. And then he has stamped his name, Harry M. Kelly, and very fancy, over on one side, one page. So I found Harry M. Kelly. This one kind of made me sad. Um, he was born 14th of November, 1888, in Council Grove, Morris County, Kansas. And he died the 12th of July, 1913, at age 24, in Kansas City, in Wyandotte County. He's buried at Mount Hope Cemetery, Kansas City, and it has his plot number. I could go visit it. And um, Harry was the son of Joseph R. Kelly and Elizabeth Clemens Kelly. He was born in Council Grove, Kansas. He was married to Minnie Catherine Woolard and had at least one child. We don't know. He was 24 years old, 7 months, and 28 days. And he was a stenographer. And he died at his home, 15, so 15 South 9th Street, Kansas City, Kansas, of general tuberculosis. I would have liked to know this guy because he likes pirates. I know who he is now. He's a stenographer. Married to a gal named Minnie. <laughs> He's only 24. <laughs> I mean, I have his book. I have his book. Tear up, we'll get a little verklempt here. <laughs> so the next thing I have was the thing that started it all. For me and my, my, my treasure hunting is because this is a treasure trove. I found it on the bottom shelf at an antique store in Salina. And it's a bride book. Although she could have written some more in here, she wrote quite a bit that was interesting. So you just open it up and it's full of like lovely little illustrations. Look at this rose. And then look at the front. This lady wasn't poor either, as I will tell you about. Um, but right here in the front um, is a place card for Miss Woolheater. Woolheater. <laughs> and it says bride book, which tells me that Miss Woolheater is the one who gave this gal this bride book as a present. And then this book is full of newspaper clippings. And this is a little, I think this is an announcement of the wedding. The bride is an accomplished young woman and quite popular in the younger society circle of the city. She was graduated from the Newton High School in the class of 1911 and was a teacher for the Lincoln School for three years. So what their names are is Florence Miller and Merle 
Oliver. So Mr. Oliver is well known to a large number of friends in Newton. He was formerly salesman and window trimmer at the clothing store of Cleaver Brothers, Cleaver Brothers, and Adair, but is now making a success of farming. So her first recording here is, um, well, yeah, because it's just like, look, look, this is how we met on the Titanic. Um, Miss Wool Hater fell out. Um, but anyway, so she says June 1909. The summer trip, no, the summer Fay Boxster invited me from Guthrie. Will Dodson suggested that he bring a man for me so that he might have Fay alone. Forrest Walden had gone out west for the summer, and three was a crowd. We went together considerable until fall, then quit. Quit. In the fall of 1913, he began calling on me again and came quite regularly until we both got caught. <laughs> incidents of our courtship. Apparently, there were no incidents. Um, but then she stuck. Let's see. September 10th, 1915. Merle Oliver left yesterday afternoon for Jesser Jefferson, Iowa. Oh no to attend the funeral of his brother Virgil, who was accidentally killed there on Tuesday. Forgot that. And then August 21st, 1915, Miss Ada Hart, Miss Florence Miller, C.C. Mack, and Merle Oliver motored to Hartford Saturday afternoon and were guests of Mr. and Mrs. Gordon Oliver. They were accompanied home by Mrs. C.C. Mack, who had been visiting Mr. and Mrs. Oliver for a week. That's in the paper. <laughs> Gossip section. And then uh, our engagement. May 13th, 1915. But was not announced until June 24th when I got my beautiful ring. Wore it first to club at Leafly's? Mrs. Sharp and Gladys were the first to congratulate me. Papa was very much delighted, but Mama doesn't approve of me going to the country to live. <laughs> and then the rest of it, uh, the, his engagement gift to me, his engagement, didn't do that. And she didn't keep his letters, I guess. The portraits, my portrait and his portrait, I think there are, they got taken out because there's little outlines there. And then these are my favorite because these are all about all the parties that she had all over the showers and they're all in the paper. She, uh, a luncheon. Miss Leslie Candelis and Miss Elva Taylor were hostesses to the members of the Plus and Minus Club. <laughs> and a few intimate friends at a charming one o'clock luncheon Saturday at the home of Miss McCandless for Miss Miller. A very dainty color combination of pink and white was used in the decoration of the home with pink and white cosmos and a profusion of hearts and cupids, pretty reminders of the prenuptial function. At the bridal table, table were seated the bride, her mother, Mrs. Max Miller, and her intimate friends, and other guests were seated at quartet tables, all decidedly pretty and inviting in lovely table appointments. The menu was served by the sisters of the hostesses, Mrs. Frank Luckinbill and Miss Helen McCandless. Ooh, the miscellaneous shower. This is one of the surprises for the bride-elect, and it was arranged in a most original manner. Following the idea that Miss Miller will reside on a farm, the hostess had converted one room into a field, and in it arranged a straw sack in which her gifts were concealed. She was presented with a pitchfork on the handle of which was a pink bow, and given instructions to pitch straw if she would recover the hidden treasures. This made a jolly feature of amusement for the packages were opened and there was the pleasure of viewing each gift. An added pleasure of the afternoon was given by Miss Helen Hagen with well-rendered vocal solos. This afternoon, Mrs. J.W. Murphy and Mrs. Forrest Walden of Kansas City will entertain at five o'clock tea at the home of Mrs. Murphy in a compliment to Miss Miller and Tuesday night, Mr. and Mrs. Le Leroy Plum will entertain in honor of Miss Miller and Mr. Oliver. 
That's just one of those. There's another luncheon here. Mrs. Henry Benfer. A l another luncheon? The Plus and Minus Club? Oh my gosh. And then prenuptial parties for Miss Miller. Beatrice Woolheater. Oh, she's the one who gave the thing. Entertained very delightfully at a paper shower. A paper shower? What is that? Like, I know what that is now after reading this, but... Uh, Friday afternoon at the home of Mrs. A. E. Smoltz for Miss Florence Miller, whose marriage to Mr. Merle Oliver will occur Wednesday evening. The guests, because Wednesday's the best day to get married, you know, according to that old poem. Saturday's absolutely the worst day to get married, according to the poem. <laughs> Paper shower idea was carried out very cleverly in every way possible. One of the features of the entertainment was the making of boudoir caps for the honor guests, each guest having a choice of color of tissue paper. Mrs. Lyle Dickey produced the most artistic cap and was awarded the prize. A very unique book of recipes was presented to the bride-to-be, each one present having been requested to write recipes for her favorite dishes for the meals for a day. That is a really good idea. My mom had that done. Um, they passed this cookbook around, or like pages in the cookbook, around to all of our female relatives and they wrote down all their favorite recipes and now it's all in one big book with all their handwriting and it's really cool because we have recipes from our my great grandmas and and people like that that we never you know they they died or people that we never see so that's really kind of a neat heirloom -y type of thing but this paper shower is brilliant because it's anything that's made of paper and there's a lot that's made of paper you just don't you have to think for a minute but it it makes you creative and that's where this bride book came from the, that was one of the presents. Now, the, a breakfast is in honor of Miss Miller from Kansas. Mary and Lillian M Miller were hostesses. I think those are her aunts. 9.30 in the morning. They're, yes, their niece, Miss Florence Miller of Newton, Kansas. Oh, gosh. What a... A parrot? What parrot? Oh, she is a very winning young woman, always pleasant and agreeable, and her friends in Newton are very sincere in saying that Mr. Oliver is a lucky man indeed. <laughs> oh my gosh, these are so cute. And there's another tea. Oh my gosh, they transformed the, par the parlor into an orchard and the branches of real trees, pink and white petals and hearts of the same colors had been attached. Man, they went to work for this gal. They must have liked her. She must have been nice because nobody who was nasty would get this many parties from this many people. And then here's their wedding announcement in the newspaper. Oh, and it was at their house. I just love how they wrote too, like the way she liked Cosmos. But the, a bank of firms and ferns and a pretty greenery effect was arranged in the music room, which was used for the ceremony at the top of which appeared tall cosmos with blooms of pink and white. And at the front, several pedestals held baskets filled with Killarney roses and Smilax. I don't know what that is. The bride's colors of pink and white predominated the decorations throughout the rooms and baskets of roses being especially attractive. And then entertainment's given for us. She wrote them down. Dinner at Aunt Mary, breakfast at Aunt Mary, luncheon, Maida, uh, dinner, Mrs. Smolt and B. That's Beatrice. Luncheon, Leslie and Elva, tea, Mrs. Murphy, evening party, uh, Helen and Leroy. And then here's some more. What is this? Oh, here's a little cute little place card. Me. Florence, July 22nd, 1915. Yes, cute little. And then I don't know what this says. Oh, it says there's. Th this is when the ants arrived. Again, in the newspaper. Nosy, nosy. Oh, and here's an here's an engagement announcement. It tells all about more stuff. More stuff. And here's just little things that she kept from her little things. Here's I don't know what this. This is probably on the table. And I don't know what this is. Oh, I think this is this belongs to that. It's just a little, these are just a little piece of paper. Here's her another little place card or a tag, maybe on a present. Florence, somebody E R. I'm not sure. That that's a cute little. So they drew a windmill on here. This is a drawing. 
This is not a print. Somebody drew that. It's cute. There's another little birdie. And then I'm assuming that this is what her wedding dress looked like. She cut this out. So this must have been her idea. Her wedding dress. And then here's another cute little tag for her. Aww. That's in the My Trousseau section. She didn't write anything. Um, she wrote about all of her other gowns that she took on the honeymoon. Blue velvet suit trimmed in black fur. A black hat with old rose ribbon and quill. Black dress, accordion pleated skirt. Dark green wool dress and silk waist to match my, uh, my something dress. My lace dress made for someone's wedding, renewed with a pink basque and silk roses, a dark blue silk blouse, and two light colored blouses. Interesting what she uh, Her invitations were informal and announcements to friends not invited and all, all out of town friends. Probably because it's in the house, you can't do a lot of it. Then, here's where she wrote down all of the gifts she got for the wedding and who gave it to her. So she could send thank you notes, because that's very important. Sending thank yous for presents you get, important. And didn't write any, nah, nah, nah. she didn't write anything about the wedding. Probably because it's in the paper, so that she just cut it out and put it in there. And then she used this book for all the people who came to the wedding. So they all wrote their names in here. They all wrote their signatures. That's really cool. It's really cool, because there's a lot. There's a name. Stinkin... Stinkin Tuner? Stinkin Tuner. That's a bad name. But here they all are. And then we come to the sad part. Because, of course, it begs the question, why is this bridal book that has all of this important information in it in an antique store? Either she had no children, or the best of medical skill, nursing, and devoted care could not avail in saving the life of Mrs. Merle Oliver, daughter of Dr. and Mrs. Max Miller, young matron so well known and loved in so many homes in Newton. And at 7.30 Tuesday evening, she received her summons from earthly life. Her friends had known that she was ill, but trusted for an improvement when the crisis had passed, and the news of her death after a brave struggle for life has brought sadness into the many homes where her friendship was treasured. Florence Miller was born in Newton in 1891, and after her graduation from the Newton High School in the class of 1910, she was a teacher in the Lincoln Building, continuing in the teaching profession for five years. On October 27th, 1915, she was united in marriage to Merle Oliver, and the first two years of their wedded life was spent on the Oliver Farm east of Newton, where the bride whose life had been spent in a city adapted herself to her country home and soon won many friends in the community by her charming personality. Nine months ago, they came to Newton and resided at 114 West Broadway, and she again became associated in her circle of friends, loved alike by the old and young. Being near the home of her parents, she was able to give them more of her companionship and was a great comfort to her mother, who was confined to her home much of the time. Mr. and Mrs. Oliver were at the home of Mrs. Oliver's parents when she became ill of influenza, which finally developed into pneumonia. Several days after her illness, her husband was stricken, and on Saturday, October 19th, both were taken to Bethel Hospital. The condition of Mr. Oliver continues to be serious, and he scarcely realized that the death of his bride of three years had occurred when he inquired for her this morning, and the sad news was told him. The sympathy of their many friends is extended to the young man thus bereft of his wife and the other relatives in the loss of their loved one. Glenn Miller, an only brother of Mrs. Oliver, of the Great Lakes Training School, arrived Monday afternoon and her aunts, Miss Mary Miller and Miss Lillian Miller, came in from Newton, Iowa, Tuesday morning. The funeral service, which will 
which will of necessity be private, will be held at the Miller residence at 210 West Broadway Friday morning at 1030. But friends may see Mrs. Oliver on Thursday afternoon from 3 to 5 o'clock and may be present at the services at Greenwood. Mrs. Oliver was a member of the Presbyterian Church and prior to her marriage had always been a member of the choir and her funeral service will be conducted by the pastor of that church, Reverend A. H. Morrison. And, but he got better. That's kind of tacked on here. The condition of Mrs. Merle Oliver, which was reported as being critical yesterday, is more favorable today. That That's... Uh, Mr. Oliver, who has been seriously ill, was not quite well in, as he was yesterday. So, and then here's... Here's her, another obituary of hers. And guess what? That town is not very far away from me. It's like 30 minutes. So I found her. I have her tombstone. I took a picture. Florence E. Miller, wife of Merle Oliver, 1891 to 1918. And I actually went there and, um, See, because her, her mother's dead, her father's dead, obviously, they're dead, this is a long time ago. Um, her brother is dead, and she had no children. Um, she was buried in her, interestingly, next to her parents. Um, and apparently, Merle Oliver married again, and he is buried with his second wife on the other side of the cemetery. And so I have, I have his picture, a picture of his tombstone also. But Florence, I felt bad for her. She was married for three years and died, so there's nobody to remember her. So I decided to plant crocuses all around her tombstone. And um, because they bloom early, and uh, like in February, so nobody's mowing then. If you planted other flowers, the sometimes they just mow right over them and they don't get to bloom, but all of these are pop up and bloom around her grave. So, I remember her, even if nobody else does. So, the lesson here, write your name in the book. Whatever book you get, you get a book for a present, you buy a book, write your name, hopefully write your hometown, and the date. So, people can remember you no matter what happens. And then they feel connected to you somehow. And that kind of like, so my last thing that I, I told you I liked old photographs, right? Well, I found this gem a while ago. It is a scrapbook of funny pictures from looks like 19 teens like very early 20s maybe that lady I'm sure has a corset on um, so yeah you can look at those pictures right now Yeah, it's a scrapbook, and I you can always find interesting things if you change your perspective. So I found this by kneeling down in one of the booths, the antique booths, and I found this on like underneath a bottom shelf. And here they all are. I don't know who they are, but they're so cute. Aren't they cute? There's some of them in funny poses driving cars, they're on their porch, they're in their Sunday white dresses, they got the dog, they're making faces, but I like them. So 
somebody took the time to make a scrapbook. And so, I have it now. It's safe. If you happen to recognize any of these names that I am reading, or any of these faces on here, let me know. Let me know. Like, are you related to these people? Let me know. I want to find out more about them. That would be really cool. I have more mysteries of antique things that I would love help with with discovering who they are and and anything like that. There's one in particular that's very dear to me and I'll have to show him to you because he's very mysterious and somewhat tragic feeling. I just get this tragic vibe. So that can be for another time. But yeah, this is another thing that I do and this is a hobby of mine, finding the lost things. And um, I have printed out everything that I found for Florence, like her tombstone and all the things on Find a Grave, but, and I'm going to do that for um, the Burfields and Mr. Dragoo and Mr. Kelly here. Um, and just keep the, that information with this antique. So I'll just put it in the back of the book or something like that. So it'll always be with them. And they won't be lost anymore.